Welcome to the International Journal of Operation and Production Management podcast series, uh, where we explore the latest research, ideas, and trends in the world of operation and production management. Speaking today are your hosts, Andrea and Osnur, as part of the social media team at IJOPM. In each episode, we'll be speaking with experts from academia, industry, and beyond to gain their insights on the most pressing issues facing operation and production management professional today as well as best practice to publish your research in one of the leading journals in the field. In this third episode of the series, we will be discussing and gaining a deeper understanding of risk and resilience research in the context of supply chain and operations management, and of course, its possible developments. To do that, we'll be speaking with Dr. Andreas Weiland, who guest edited the special issue titled Rethinking Resilience in Today's Complex, Interconnected World linking supply chain resilience research with other disciplines. This special issue was published in the International Journal of Operations and Production Management, issue one of 2023. So thank you so much for your time and presence today, Andrea. So as a start, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? My name is Andreas Wieland from the Copenhagen Business School. I've been doing research on supply chain resilience as well as risk management for many years now. And that is also what motivated me together with the rest of the team to conduct uh, research, uh, but also co-edit this special issue on resilience. All right, time to dip into the topic of this podcast. We have all heard about the concept of risk management and resilience in the last two years. However, it seems that these terms are still getting used interchangeably and confusingly, especially in the news. So could you please provide definitions and differences between the concepts of resilience, resiliency, and risk management? Yeah, for me, supply chain risk management, when that started around the year 2000, the literature on this uh, term uh, was a very important development in the supply chain management literature. Uh, it was the attempt, so to say, to take knowledge that we knew about how to manage risk in a company and extend the scope to now manage a bigger system, not the company, but the supply chain. So that was a very important development. But I think what what went wrong or maybe what is not sufficient, I, I wouldn't say went wrong, but what is maybe not sufficient here is it still has this focus on we can control everything. And in a company, of course, companies are hierarchical structures. So you can have a list with risks that occur within that company. For instance, a strike or a factory a fire or a machine not running. Uh, you can control that. You can think about all these topics. But we've seen then later uh, when you extend this not just looking at your own company, but at this much bigger system, the supply chain, which consists of not one company, but maybe some thousand companies, then it's, of course, almost impossible to think about all the risks that might occur everywhere in this big system. So that sparked, so to say, then uh, the discussions about resilience, because resilience is not about trying to control everything, like using this traditional structure of uh, identifying, assessing, and then yeah, controlling risk. But it is more about how can I create a system, the supply chain, that is more yeah, buffering against things. Whatever happens, uh, even things that you have never thought about, will then somehow be automatically coped with. That, of course, is therefore, and we assumingly will discuss this a bit later, um, um, make make it a, quite a fuzzy term, so uh, difficult to grasp. But the more important is that we uh, also today talk about this. Thank you so much. And you already uh, touched a little bit uh, uh, what what we want to to discuss with you next. Uh, so th these are become a hot topics, uh, uh, considering what happened in the world uh, in 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 the last year. So uh, our question is like from a practical perspective. Uh, have these concepts changed uh, compared to how they were perceived and managed three, four years ago? So COVID, climate change, uh, Russia, Ukraine war. Uh, so do, do these events have changed the way companies see and define resiliency and risk management in their supply chain from your perspective? 
Yeah, I would say when the term supply chain resilience emerged, when it was used quite a lot some years ago or many years ago now, um, it was still seen as somehow like making the supply chain robust. So stabilizing it um, as you stabilize an atomic power plant. So if something happens with it, nothing will happen because it's so stable and um, yeah, robust um, that nothing really can happen. Or if something happens, then you can bounce back. So this term bouncing back was used very much in the early supply chain resilience literature. And that has changed now. Now it's not bouncing back. It's also about bouncing forward, reimagining how the supply chain might look like in the future. And that is actually what we really try to discuss also in our uh, introduction of the special issue that we say resilience is different things. It is stability. It is controlling things like uh, robustness. That's the first thing. But it's also adaptability. So if things happen, then you are able to adapt to them. So if the climate changes, then the forest can adapt to it. But the same then applies uh, to the supply chain. So if the market environment changes, then you can adapt to it. But also, and that's the third element, to transform in the face of change. So if things are happening, then you, are, then you can even think about where do we want to be in the future? So this goes beyond adaptation because it's proactive. It is about we have learned things and now we know we can't go ahead like this forever. So we really need to do th something about it. And that is really how I see resilience. So this is not uh, the old path is bad and the new path is, uh, is good. Like transformation is good only and um, persistence or robustness is bad. But all three elements actually are important. They need to be thought together and uh, in parallel. Thank you. Actually, we believe that this evolution has also an impact on the way companies manage risks and build resilience in their supply chains. In your opinion, what are the most significant challenges that managers face today when it comes to effectively managing supply chain risks and building resilience? And also, we have one more question. What are the some best practices and strategies that you have observed in your research for mitigating supply chain disruptions and enhancing resilience? So I think one improvement in the last few years that is certainly um, due to COVID and the debates around it is that more and more companies have really realized how important supply chain management is and especially how important supply chain resilience is. But I think it still hasn't really entirely arrived uh, in everyone's head. Um, decision makers often don't have a supply chain education. They don't know about supply chain resilience uh, from their, uh, let's say, MBA courses yet. That is changing now, but still people need to convince the CFO of their company uh, that uh, yeah, money needs to be spent into resources that might never be needed in the future. So I think there are some organizational issues around that. Another challenge uh, is certainly also now every company has implemented that, but I've already seen that a few years ago, there was this, uh, this big earthquake in Japan. Um, everyone was reacting to it. Companies have changed. But then with the next generation of managers and a rather calm phase over a few years where not so many issues happened, so that was before COVID, some companies have also forgotten about that. So I think the challenge uh, or the second challenge that I would like to mention is forgetting good practices. So companies, and now I'm switching to your second part of the question, companies need to somehow find a way to really turn risk management and resilience thinking um, that, that, that should become a part of the DNA of the company. So when people wake up in the morning, they should already think about what could go wrong and prepare for that and think about business models that um, are a bit decoupled from big crises. 
to connect it to uh, what we just discussed, uh, um, so traditionally, when we think about uh, resiliency and risk management, uh, uh, so in companies, this has always been associated with uh, investment in additional resources, uh, uh, which can be seen as a way that compromise uh, uh, company efficiency. So our question is, uh, like, is this still true today? So how in today's world uh, can organization balance the trade-off between uh, reaching efficient, efficiency and, and cost advantages and building robustness and resiliency again, against disruption? And do you have any suggestion about model or framework that uh, uh, decision makers in companies can use uh, to uh, make this uh, risk management decision? So I would say resilience is never for free. So there's no free lunch. There's no free resilience. You always need to make investments uh, yeah, to, to increase the resilience of your company, but also, of course, then of your supply chain, of your supply base. Um, because it's not for free, it means you need to invest in different things. And that relates a bit to what I said before, these three views that I uh, proposed uh, that we discuss also in our article um, that is persistence, adaptation, or adaptability and transformability, um, they require different investments. The first one is, as you say, investments maybe in redundancy, more um, buffer inventory, more people. Addition, so often it's about redundancy also, more transportation rounds, alternatives, more suppliers, not just one. So I think that is crucial, that is still important, that will be important also in the future. But adaptability requires a different type of thinking. It requires um, to think in different ways to hire maybe people, and the same applies for transformability, who are not just trained in risk management and supply chain management, but that can also be social scientists, that can be engineers, that can be um a team that is, and I think supply chain management has always um, good in putting teams together that that um, are recruited from different areas, cross-functional, even cross-organizational, but even going beyond management thinking and uh, having philosophers on board of people who really know about politics. Many supply chain issues nowadays are political issues. The Ukraine or the the attack of Russia against Ukraine is obviously a political issue, but it has consequences for supply chain or the trade war that we discussed a few years ago uh, between the US and China has a political background, but also has um, consequences for supply chains. So looking at these political problems or at, at the climate crisis only from a perspective of supply chain management will not be enough in the future. That means uh, we need a team that knows a lot of different things and we need to train. That's also, if you ask me as an educator, uh, something we, we should do about it. So when you talk about frameworks, I would say there is no perfect solution structures uh, like 10 points that you need to do. There is more ambiguity, but it is possible, I think, from training and how we hire to uh, get get this ambiguity on board also in decision making. Thank you very much for these really useful insights. I have a follow up question on this. With increasing complexity of global supply chains, we are curious about how important is it for organizations to consider environmental sustainability and social responsibility when they are managing risks? And also, how can these aspects be integrated into the risk and resilience strategies. I'm almost surprised about how we react um, nowadays. We just have to look out of the window. Currently, Greece is burning. Uh, in the US, heat waves. In China, heat waves. In India recently, heat waves. We are really in the midst of, of, a, of an existential climate crisis. And I'm not even talking about biodiversity crisis. And still, we're very much talking about business as normal, business as usual. That is very different from um, COVID. So suddenly, from one day to the other, uh, whole countries were shut, uh, shut down. 
um, masks were required, et cetera. So in that case of COVID, we really looked at the crisis. But when it comes to the environment, we are not doing that. I'm very personally, I'm very surprised and also very concerned about it. So I would say in the 21st century, the environmental problems around that, the existential environmental crisis are the should be the focus of any um, decision making uh, of any manager. Business models very soon, and this is really then also talking about adaptation and transformation, business models very soon will disappear that are harming the environment because uh, within a few years, we will have to react, we will have to act, we will have to not just promise and look at goals uh, or CO2 goals in 50 years from now, but we really have to act now. So therefore, this is one of the core, if not the core of current resilience thinking, and it should at least be there. And those who haven't realized this yet, also for their own business models, should look back at uh, examples like Kodak, uh, where people thought they can go on with old school thinking um, forever. And then it was too late. So I think every manager really, really has to put this in the focus of their minds. And by the way, also academics, uh, I still see that uh, sustainability topics are looked at as like soft topics that are sent to some sustainability journals or ethics journals instead of uh, really focusing on this as the core of nowadays 21st century management. So we now want to switch the conversation a little bit, uh, uh, looking at risk and resilience from like a research perspective, uh, because uh, as uh, the topic has grown uh, importance in practice, uh, uh, if you look at what the research has produced in, in the last years, uh, uh, well, we can see that there has been an explosion of publication focused on risk and resilience. So like this raised the question of like, Today, uh, considering that risk and resilience are also like historical topic in supply chain, so what more can be studied? So in your opinion, what are the key emerging research areas uh, in risk and resilience within supply chain management that still require like additional uh, research in our field? And uh, if you envision a particular evolution in this area in, uh, in the near future? Yeah, so... One or maybe the most important reason why I thought we need just another special issue on resilience was because I think although we have so many articles now covering supply chain resilience, we are still not sufficiently connected to the wider resilience debates in other fields. One of my former colleagues once said, Andreas, if you want to be famous in academia, you need to take a topic from another discipline that is taken for granted or even different field that is taken for granted there and transplant it to your own. And um, I always thought about this, not as a strategy to become famous, but as a strategy to do really interesting research. Because what I and I blame myself have overlooked for many years during my PhD and also still afterwards was the ongoing debates in other fields, especially in Ecology, and I'm not talking now about uh, climate or sustainability issues, but ecology really how forests, for instance, evolve as systems, how they are studied. And they have these debates around resilience. They, they, they discussed this for decades now and uh, thought about first about resilience as an engineered system, like persistence, control. As we still very often doing supply chain management. But then they realized in um, their field that is something that is a bit difficult to uh, do because you can't control a forest. You can plan it, of course, to a certain extent, but it will still evolve and change and uh, different species will uh, emerge. And then the same also applies for other social systems like cities. And that inspired me very much um, and also two of our co-editors for this special issue, uh, Simon Davudi, she studied how cities evolved, so urban systems and how resilience can be implemented there. And Lisa Schulz, 
who did this uh, for social ecology. So we deliberately in our team of guest editors, and uh, Stephen Melnick is then the, the fifth one um, in the team. So we deliberately had a, a team that looked at resilience from different perspectives. And what I would like to wish for, and this is still emerging, although I think now more and more established, also uh, our special issue is a part of that. What we really try to establish is uh, a f foundation for even more research on resilience that take the wider debates in the resilience literature, resilience thinking literature, and social ecological resilience thinking literature uh, into consideration and uses all the knowledge that has been developed there to make supply chains more resilient. Uh, because supply chain management has quite an engineering tradition, although it's management, uh, we have overlooked or we have been overlooking these topics a bit. Can you please provide examples of recent research studies, maybe findings or trends that highlight innovative approaches to studying risk and resilience, maybe in specific industries or supply chain contexts? Yeah, so I would suggest every supply chain a resilience academic to read things that are outside of their discipline. So good examples are from um, key thinkers, not only recent, but um, also more um, traditional literature, maybe in the social ecological literature. So what Holling wrote about engineering resilience versus ecological resilience, or what uh, Folke, uh, I also cited these articles uh, in, in the introduction article of our special issue, what Folke wrote when he talks about resilience taking a social ecological systems perspective um walker had a great paper resilience what it is and what it is not right so uh, these are great papers but then also what um simon and uh, simon davudi and uh, leeson schultz published so uh, simon davudi wrote about evolutionary resilience and how to use that for to study uh, cities and urban si urban systems because supply chains are also social systems like cities. So this is really useful and was very useful for my own thinking, but also for some of the others in our um, editor team. And also what Leeson, uh, together with many co-authors, uh, is doing in Stockholm. So the Stockholm Resilience Center provides so many great ideas. So that is something I can really recommend. And then there is, of course, the applications to uh, our discipline to supply chain management. And uh, in our special issue, we have several articles that cover that. Um, we have an article that looks at panarchy. By the way, also, I've wrote an article, Dancing the Supply Chain, which is a resilience article um, that was published uh, two years ago. But um, many people now in the field and in our special issue also uh, take resilience thinking from other disciplines really uh, seriously. So I can recommend everyone to look into our special issue. Um, and I'm not saying this just because I'm the editor, but I'm really convinced uh, by uh, some of these great thoughts that um, the authors have brought forward here. So thank you so much. Um, still from a research perspective, so studying uh, risk and resilience is quite challenging because these are like dynamic concepts that usually evolve over time and they are connected to other supply chain capabilities. So uh, one of the things that researchers in this area uh, face as a challenge is uh, um, like what methods and or type of data they should collect to study the uh, phenomenon appropriately. So we were wondering if you have any suggestion in this regard or how have you addressed or overcome these challenges in your uh, own work in, in the past and, and, and in the present? Yeah, I can only speak for empirical researchers here or empirical research because that is my own perspective. But there's, of course, many qualitative but also many quantitative perspectives. In both areas, I think it's... Um, really an opportunity to look at resilience, also other phenomena in supply chain management, but uh, now we're talking about resilience, uh, to look at them from a social science perspective. So not only to uh, try to look for optimality and uh, perfection in measurement, but also take more subjective perspectives. 
So not just positivist type of research, but uh, interpretivist type of research, for instance. Um, that is in qualitative research is particularly missing, I think, in the supply chain management literature. If you look at neighboring disciplines, even accounting or, um, yeah, of course, organization studies, um, th this is much more widespread. So I can suggest or I can um, discuss at least with qualitative supply chain management scholars uh, the opportunity to um, look into different types of qualitative research. The challenge maybe for quantitative research is, is really the size of the system that we are looking at. So supply chains are really big things. It is not just a company where you can talk to many people, where you can get some Excel files or great data, but it's systems that consist of thousands of companies and really to cover them without simplifying them too much. Because if we only stay at the company level, then we already have a lot of data, but uh, then really taking the individual, individual perspective also into account, then it becomes even more challenging. But I think what is not sufficient in quantitative research anymore, and I did that myself uh, in my during my PhD, but I think it's not sufficient anymore to have a small data set with 200 survey responses or so, but to become really quantitative. Big companies, Google, et cetera, Amazon, they have so large databases and we in academia, we can't um, keep conducting research like we did in the 1970s, given also the complexities that you talked about. So we really need to take to, to, to become really quantitative and uh, for the qualitative academics to become really qualitative and take these opportunities um, that also here other fields and other disciplines offer. Um, the methods are there. We just have to discover them. So like to conclude like our conversation with, with like a positive message uh, to our uh, uh, field. Uh, so if you have to give uh, one suggestion, one big suggestion to researchers that are planning to enter the field of supply chain risk and resilience, uh, uh, what would uh, this suggestion be from your perspective? I think that's a suggestion that I already mentioned uh, before. Um, don't just read supply chain journals, try to be inspired by other journals, but then think about this knowledge that you then gained and uh, try to think about what would that mean for a supply chain? Of course, you can't just transfer the knowledge uh, and say a supply chain behaves like a forest or like a dense floor or whatever, but you can at least think about what could, um, how, how could this knowledge be transformed so that you can actually then um, think differently about uh, supply chains. And um, I would say that is what we have tried in our special issue. Thank you so much. That's all for today's episode of the International Journal of Operations and Production Management podcast. We hope you found this discussion informative and valuable. We'd like to thank our guest, Andrea, for sharing their insights and perspectives on this important topic. And a big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss an episode. And if you have any feedback and suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about the most recent research and trends in the field of operation and production management with a particular emphasis on risk and resilience, be sure to visit the International Journal of Operation and Production Management website at www.emeraldgrouppublishing.com slash journal slash IGOPM. There, you can read the most recent articles, submit your own research, and keep up with the latest development in the field. Particularly, if you visit issue number one published in 2023, you will be able to read the articles that IGPM included in the special issue, Rethinking Resilience in Today's Complex Interconnected World, Linking Supply Chain Resilient Research with Other Discipline, which presents the most recent academic development in this field. Thank you for listening again, and we hope to share more insights and perspective with you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.